Amen. Well, go ahead and grab a seat. Um, hopefully, you all got one of the handouts that can help you to sort of jot stuff down as we go through this outline tonight. We are in our series, Need to Know, and so we're, each week we're handling areas that it's really important for Christians to know about them, what the Bible says about them, and so on. So um, tonight we're talking about what we need to know about sharing your faith, about talking to other people about what it means to trust in Jesus or to become a Christian, to follow him. And so the first thing I want to talk about just briefly is how important this is. For an awful lot of Christians, they don't even really think about, I ought to talk to other people about Jesus. I ought to share the good news of the gospel with people. Maybe they just think that's the job of pastors or evangelists. Maybe they feel like, oh, I'm afraid they're going to ask me questions that I won't know how to answer. Um, there are all sorts, you know, there are some people who believe, well, if somebody's supposed to get saved, they're going to get saved whether I talk to them or not. But this is something that's very important for us. It's not only good for people who need to know Jesus, but it's good for us as, as it reaffirms our commitment to the Lord and our faith in him as well. The first verse that I, that I put down there, and you don't need to look it up, but it's Proverbs 11.30, and it says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. In other words, it's just the best thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's, you know, it, in the same way that when you have fruit coming out of your life, it becomes a tree of life. Life begets life. And so if, if what you are experiencing is real spiritual connection, then it's only the smart thing to do and the compassionate thing to do as well. But Pro Proverbs Solomon says it's wisdom to be able to then want to win people's souls. Now, it's not winning people to our views or trying to win an argument. It's about that I care about this person at the depth of their being, at their very soul. And as a result, I want them to win. Um, of course, John 3.16, which most of you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him won't perish, but have everlasting life. Getting people to understand who Jesus is and then coming into a relationship with him which saves them forever is the whole point you know, behind Jesus coming to earth. Jesus coming was God's statement that I really love the world and the only way that that love becomes ultimately experienced by people is if they come to understand that God loves them and that he gave his only son, that they could believe in him and discover life. So if that was such an important agenda for God himself that he would send his son, then it certainly ought to matter to us. It certainly should be important to us. An important verse uh, and you can turn over there, Second Peter 3, verse 9. This is a powerful verse about the fact that God doesn't just want some people to get saved, but it's also such an important reminder of God's desire for us to share about him. It says, Peter says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness. In other words, he hasn't returned yet. Uh, in the previous verse, he said, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. He's not slacking off concerning what he promised, as some count slackness. But he is long-suffering or patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants people to get saved. And the reason why Jesus hasn't come back yet is because he's waiting for us. What's he waiting for us to do? Patient toward us, long-suffering toward us. Maybe partly it's like, yeah, he's waiting for certain people to receive him because he loves them. But a part of this may be that he's waiting for us to do the job that we have to communicate that truth and so, if, when we understand that his heart is for people to get saved, 
And when we understand that he is giving us a responsibility, an obligation really, to participate in that extension of the good news, then that should cause us to work our way through a lot of the reasons why we kind of don't say much about the gospel or we're hesitant. What if there's somebody that God's been calling you to talk to and you've been dragging your feet and God patiently waits and that person might be the last person that's going to get saved and then we could go to heaven. I, I suggest that he has to be really patient because for so many of us, we just don't have the same heart that he has. We would say in our mind, oh yeah, we want everyone to get saved. But if you really wanted people to get saved, wouldn't you tell some people about him? Wouldn't that be an important desire? If you're walking down the street and you see a house on fire, the smoke and flames are pouring out of the back of the house, but you see the people up there in their front window and they don't even know that their house is on fire, how shy would you be in going up to a stranger's house and going, your house is on fire, you gotta get out of there. And yet what we believe is that people who don't have Jesus are condemned forever to be apart from God, to be apart from everything that's good. Um, how much do we really believe that? But it's something that he has a, a great heart for, and it's important for us to recognize this. Paul gives us some examples. I, I put a couple here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he it's that passage where he says, I have become, you know, to the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that I might by all means save some. Paul was saying, I am incredibly flexible. Before that, in the previous verse, he says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew. To whoever it is that I'm talking to, I would connect with them on the level that they are at because for me, I want to do anything that I can possibly do to try to save some people. How many of us can say with our lives that we have deliberately modified the way that we live, the people we talk to, the concerns that we address? Because like Paul, we're like, man, I would do about anything just to save some people. But that was the heart of, that's the heart of God. That was the heart of Paul. And, and then he has that challenge in Romans 10 and verse 14 where he says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher, without someone to declare it? So he's saying, Look, you may want people to get saved. You may want people to know about God, but it doesn't just happen. God doesn't just, you know, come to people and reveal himself to them individually, usually. There are extreme cases sometimes where that happens. But Paul says, look, if they're going to know they need to hear, if they're going to hear, somebody needs to tell them. And I think that's a great challenge for us as we talk about how do we talk to people about our faith to realize that that's how people find out that their life can be changed because someone is willing to declare to them the truth. Now, there are some helpful biblical examples and you know, John chapter three is one of them where Jesus came, or Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, came to Jesus by night and wanted to talk to him. And, in, and there's so much that, that we learn about this. First of all, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Notice this, and, and this is usually the case. A lot of times when we talk about evangelism, we talk about outreach. But in this case, and there are many other cases that we could talk about as well, Nicodemus came to Jesus. Jesus was doing what he did. 
He was following the calling that the Father had on his life, and all he had to do was respond to someone who came to him. That puts you in a distinctly advantageous position over you trying to go to somebody else, confronting a stranger, and trying to, so hey, uh, you, you, if you died tonight, you know where you'd go tomorrow, or those kinds of artificial conversations that sometimes happen. It lets you know that if you're doing life right, actually people are coming to you with certain questions. Now, Nicodemus' question wasn't necessarily, you know, as you read it, he, he uh, you know, he said, we know you're a teacher. No one can do these things you do unless God is with you. Now, Nicodemus wasn't necessarily asking anything. What he was really doing is just saying, you know, I really appreciate you, Jesus. I'm a teacher. You're a teacher. You're doing some great things. That's awesome. But that was, that little conversation opened the door to Jesus. And again, you don't see him going out to find people for the most part, to share the gospel with them. You just see him as he meets people in his life, and there are times, and we'll talk about John 4, but there are times when he put himself in a place where he would be there for it. But, you know, here with Nicodemus, he was responding to questions and statements. Jesus also, he didn't just say, okay, look, here's the deal. You need to do this, this, this. He didn't jump right to John 3.16. He got into a conversation. He asked him questions. He, he made a, a kind of a radical statement. You, know, you understand that unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. What in the world would that have meant? Except that it was like, boy, this opens a really interesting conversation. By saying something sort of titillating, by saying something that was rather mysterious, by making a statement that invited further conversation, and then Jesus began to explore that more. But also, you know, uh, he was making them think by asking them questions. He didn't push for a decision. You know, as you read down through here, where the whole thing ends after he tells them John 3, 16 and all that, and, and he finally says in verse 21, whoever does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. After saying, everyone who practices evil hates the light, you know, whoever comes to the light, he, this is where God works in his life. Boom, that's the end of it. It's kind of weird by our perspective that he didn't say so. Would you like to pray a prayer right now and come to the light? It's kind of odd that as Jesus talked to him, he kind of left it hanging there. Now, we know later on in John that Nicodemus actually ended up following Jesus. But Jesus wasn't pushing for a decision, and he never does. Jesus, throughout the Gospels, he shares some truth with somebody, and it's basically like, so, that's it. Take it or leave it. You can follow me. You don't have to. It's nothing personal. You don't get the feeling that Jesus was desperate to get people to a decision. In fact, often he seemed to say things that would make people think twice before making a decision. If Jesus had just got up there and said, look, all you need to do to go to heaven is come here and let's pray a little prayer and you're set for life. Everyone would have accepted him if that was what he came to do, was just to find and get an easy response from people. But with Jesus, he's looking for something deeper than just mental assent. He's looking for somebody to commit their entire life to walk with him, to follow him, and he doesn't push for that decision. And not only that, some of the things that he says, you could read through the chapter if you're not familiar with it, but... You know, Jesus, as you know, Nicodemus is asking him some questions, Jesus said, are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know this stuff? Wow, I mean, that seems sort of offensive to a teacher of Israel. But Jesus didn't, he wasn't so seeker friendly that he avoided saying anything that might be offensive or controversial. He took that chance because he knew that it was gonna 
going to make Nicodemus think. But he also wasn't doing this in front of a bunch of people. They were having a private conversation. So it was pretty easy for him to be able to take some liberties without alienating a guy who, after all, you came to me. I think so often when we try to go to people all the time, it puts us at a real disadvantage because it's like, I'm the one that wants to talk to you. And I don't care whether you're busy or not. I'm knocking on your door. I'm going, hey, let's talk about this. And at any point, if it's sort of offensive, they can just go, look, you're the one that came to talk to me. I didn't come and talk to you. There's this thing that we have so often that we answer questions that nobody has. That, we, that we're just like so anxious to answer questions that we even presume what the questions are. And we think somehow that somebody ought to sit there and listen to us. It's a whole different thing when somebody wants to talk to us. But again, no call for a decision. No, you know, uh, you know trying to put it all together. He, he, there's so much, there, you could come away, if you were Nicodemus, you'd come away with more questions than answers. So what's Nicodemus do, obviously? He clearly would have continued to listen to the stuff Jesus was saying to follow him, perhaps from a distance, later certainly had put faith in him, but it's this soft sell approach that Jesus uses that we see him use to a huge degree. He is never, there are evangelists who, and Billy Graham, I think, is maybe the first one who started saying this, and everyone else just thinks it's good to say since Billy says it, but you know, you always hear Billy Graham saying, Everyone who Jesus called, he called publicly. Well, not only is this one example where he didn't call him publicly at all, they had a private conversation, you would be hard-pressed to find any example of Jesus calling people publicly. It was all personal with him. It was talking to one person and saying, do you want to follow me? Or addressing one person and and dealing with some of their concerns or giving them some ideas. But you don't, as much as, let's face it, God loves the world. No one wants people to get saved more than Jesus. And yet, he didn't seem obsessed with putting notches in his belt. He didn't seem to feel like, okay, the more people I get saved today, the better. He often would actually turn people away would say hard statements, like he did with the rich young ruler who's like, oh, come on, I want to follow you. And he goes, okay, how about obeying the law? Yeah, I do it all, okay. Um, how about selling everything you have and giving it to the poor and come and follow me? You'll have treasure in heaven. And the guy's like, oh, man. I mean, how many people today would actually get saved if somebody said the first requirement is sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me? But this is Jesus. It's the way he deals with people over and over again. Now in the next chapter, in John chapter 4, you have Jesus going to Samaria. And it says in verse 4 of John 4, uh, they left in verse 3, they left Judea and departed to Galilee. So they're heading from the south of Israel up to the north. But he needed to go through Samaria. He didn't need to go through Samaria, except that obviously Jesus felt led by the Holy Spirit to go to a place that they ordinarily wouldn't travel through. And as you read through, you see the woman of Samaria coming to this well where Jesus is just waiting by himself. And it says that in verse 7, woman of Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to buy food. And the woman of Samaria in verse 9 said, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And he goes on, he says, Man, if you knew the gift of God, you'd be asking me for a drink. I can give you something that will make you never thirst again. She's like, Give it to me. She, they're getting into a little bit of religious talk at this point. And so she asks him, So where should we worship? You Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem. Our fathers say that here, Mount Gerizim, is the place in Samaria where we should worship. What is it? And Jesus, again, some of the things that he says to her um, are, you know, just shocking. As he, 
He says, there's going to be a time when you won't worship. He said, the Jews are right, but the truth is, the day is coming, and in fact, it's here now, when your worship doesn't have anything to do with where you are. And so they begin to have this conversation, and, and he says, hey, why don't you go and get your husband? She's like, I don't have a husband. He says, yeah, that's true. You've had five, and now you're shacking up with some guy. So, yeah, I guess you're right. No husband. And then she's like, whoa, you must be the Messiah. Or we know Messiah is coming. And he goes, yeah, that's me. And then she leaves and brings all these people from the, from the, from the city or the village to come out. And many people put their faith in Jesus. But, you know, it was a divine appointment. He needed to go to Samaria. And that tells me that if we want to be used by God in this way, we need to be open to detours in our lives, that we need to just think that God, if we listen to him, may lead us to the right person to talk to instead of us just going and pestering whoever we happen to see or the same people over and over again. And I think you know that here we see there's this sensitivity to the Holy Spirit that it's like, you know, I think I'm going to go here. But when he talks to the woman at the well, he doesn't, when she walks up, he doesn't say, so you ever hear the four spiritual laws or, you know, you're going to hell if you die. Or He's like, he asks her for help. It was such a, and, and she was kind of shocked because people didn't respect her very well. But he respected her more than other people, probably more than her five husbands ever did. And and more than the people in the city would have for her as well. He respected her, and he actually asked her for help. Now, what does that do when someone asks you for help? You feel like you matter. You feel like you're respected. You don't feel like you have a target on your back that, look, I have the truth, and you don't, and let me tell you how stupid you are, how smart I am, and let's get this thing done because you need to be more like me. And he's Jesus. I mean, if anybody ever deserved to have a little bit of a, you know, looking down on people, it would have been him, and yet he never did that. And I think it's important for us. If we want to talk to people about Jesus, we should do it kind of like he did. And so following some of these examples and realizing, okay, I need to show respect to people. Sometimes I need to ask people for help. It shows that that you know, I uh, you know, value them, that I think they have something to offer. He didn't have a bucket to pull water out of the well. She did. Hey, can you give me a hand? But it, always asking for help. Like, it's one of the reasons why I think sometimes when we just totally want to associate with Christians all the time and never ask for help from anybody other than a Christian, it's a big mistake. Because sometimes asking people for help is a real honoring thing. I've, I've, told, I've said this before on Sunday, but I read a book by a guy who used to recruit spies for the U.S. government, and he talked about how you can talk to people and approach them, and he said one of the things you want to do right away is treat someone like they know something that you don't and ask them to help you. And so he gave an example is that, you know, if he's in a store and, you know, with getting something for his wife, and if he sees a woman in the store, he'll go and make it obvious that he's not hitting on her because he's at mentioning his wife. And he would say, you know, you look like you have great taste and you're about the size of my wife. What, which of these do you think she would like? And, you know, right away you show somebody that kind of respect and they're more than happy to help you. They want to talk to you. She was shocked by his respect. She was blessed that he was asking her for help because no Jew would ever ask anything of a Samaritan. And that's what opened the door, that kind of respect. He also wasn't condemning to her. He didn't right away jump with the, so you're in adultery, thus saith the Lord. You've you divorced five times, and now you're living with a man. Do you understand that's going to send you to hell forever? No, even when it came up, he's just like, yeah, that's true. You've been married five times, and now you living with a guy, so yeah, you're right, you don't have a husband. And that must have been a shock to her too because in their system, whether it was with the Samaritan religious system, which was a twisted form of Judaism, or whether it was from Jews, they were used to people standing out there like, 
guys that you see, we had some guys out here at the, at the curb one day picketing, and they're just wanting to yell at people about how bad of sin, sinners that they are. And we've seen it, if you go to LA around the Coliseum, there's guys who are just constantly, you're all going to hell, you're fornicating, you're a drunkard, you're, and it's like, really? And you're doing that in Jesus' name, but Jesus didn't do that? He didn't seem obsessed with helping people to see that they are a failure. Because generally people already know they're a failure. This is why I think that there are people who, um, there's um, a few guys in particular whose whole system of sharing the gospel is to start with the Ten Commandments and the law and get people to see that they are guilty, that they are sinners. So that's their first emphasis. Too bad Jesus didn't know about that because he never used that as an introductory conversation. He pretty much assumes, and, and you see it in John 3 after you know, verse 17 where he says, look, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world. The world's condemned before I ever got here. I came to save. I came on a rescue mission. And I think that there's a lot that we could learn if we feel like, I don't have to convince somebody that they're messed up. I'm assuming that deep down inside, they kind of know that their life isn't what it could be. And certainly, that's what Jesus did. Now, over in Acts, and there's so many other things. If you read John 3 and 4, you'll get a whole lot of ideas about how sharing with somebody and how, you know, can be either bad or good the way we typically do it. But in Acts chapter 2, the first great sermon. Now, you might think, well, in a sermon, it's going to be a lot different than it is otherwise, right, than personal evangelism. And, and there's some truth to that, for sure. But in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came on these guys. They're speaking in other languages, and everybody surrounding them is like going, these guys are drunk. They sound like a bunch of drunkards. And that's, interestingly, is Peter's introduction to his sermon. He heard what they thought. He was listening to what they were saying. And as, as he, um, you know, as they were amazed, Peter stood up in verse 14 and raised his voice and said to them, let me clarify something. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he goes on to quote all that from Joel chapter 2. And then in verse 22, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, signs. You saw what he did. And uh, he was delivered by God's will and his foreknowledge. And you broke the law and crucified him, put him to death. But God raised him up and he loosed the pains of death. And then he quotes, he quotes David in, you know, talking about this, your flesh not seeing corruption and all that. And so, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. He's dead and buried. And so he goes on to develop this whole thing. And, and his message, as he consistently quotes the Old Testament, and then says, what God promised then, he is providing for you. Now, let's think about what Peter did here. First of all, he didn't just gather a crowd so that he could, oh, I'm going to preach a sermon. I want you to listen to this. He was listening to them. And he was going, let me clarify something for you. Then his whole message is from their frame of reference. He's in Jerusalem at the temple. And so he preaches to them from their scriptures, from the Old Testament, and talks about how what we have seen happen with Jesus is something that you should know something about because your prophets, your scriptures, set the stage for all of this. This is actually a fulfillment of that prophecy. Now, he showed how Jesus fulfilled scriptures, and, but that was their frame of reference too. I don't think necessarily that if the Holy Spirit had come on Peter in a different circumstance that he would have done an Old Testament sermon. You know, because, and you don't see him 
preaching in the same way at Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10, for instance, when he's speaking to Gentiles. But he cued in to their frame of reference, and he worked from that. He understood them. He wanted to show them the scriptures, but tying the scriptures into what they believed, then therefore showing how Jesus was a fulfillment of that which they professed to believe. It's also interesting that after this great sermon, to which, by the way, 3,000 people came up to get saved, if you notice as you read, you know, in verse, as he finished up the message, like verse 36, Acts chapter 2, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Notice it's not very friendly language. He goes, yeah, you killed him. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? It's then that he said, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for this promise is for you. And with many other words in verse 40, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved. But it was always, they gladly received his word, by the way, but he wasn't, he didn't build his message up and say, now, here's what you need to do. He presented the truth and waited until they said, so what do we do? See what kind of leverage that gives you? When you talk to somebody enough about what Jesus has done that they want to know, okay, what can I do? What should I do? It's totally different than if you take a group of people and just say, here's what you need to do. And a lot of them are just like, I haven't even asked you what I need to do. I haven't had a chance to think about this. I'm, I need to process this a little bit. But again, you see this, you know, this uh, sensitivity to who they were, where they were at, not forcing it on them, responding to what they were saying, and at the same time, giving them space to figure out that they had one more question. What should we do? The Holy Spirit was poured out and was working in their hearts so that they were actually asking, what should we do? That's, that's a lot different than him getting up there and saying, here's what I want you to do. That's just different. Now, having said all that, let me make it clear. I don't think there's anything wrong with you know, asking people, hey, do you want to accept Jesus? I don't think there's anything wrong with preaching the gospel and giving people a chance to come forward in an altar call. There, God has used that to bring a lot of people to himself. My point is that that isn't how it was done by the apostles. That was not how it was done by Jesus. So let's, let's not pretend like that's the only way to do it. Let's recognize, hey, as long as people hear the truth and respond, that's a good thing. That is a win. But I'm surprised how often as we look at the preaching of Jesus, as we look at the preaching of the apostles, that they really didn't seem like their goal was to close the deal. They really, their goal was to share the truth in a way that would draw people in, that would catch their interest, that they could relate to themselves. I think it's important for us to know that, but at the same time, I'm certainly not knocking, you, you know, coming up and cold cocking strangers with the gospel, or to me, if somebody gets saved, that's a good thing. I don't care, but, it, but we shouldn't act like a particular methodology is the one that we ought to use because, well, it works better or whatever. If we have discovered <coughs> in our culture some things that seem to work, great. But let's just not pretend like, yeah, that's the way Jesus wanted it to be done. It's just cultures differ, people differ. Um, it's most important that people hear the gospel. But when it comes to methodology, when we look at the scriptures, we find that we don't need to be as locked into maybe some of the um, methods that have become just like the only way to share the gospel with people. I have Acts 16 there. That's just the story. You don't need to turn there because we're running short on time already. But, but it's the story of Paul and Silas being in prison in Philippi. And they were just singing hymns in prison in the middle of the night, which was weird when, you know, you get thrown in prison, you get beaten, you're in this 
dank, ugly prison, and here they are praising God. But then when God shook the place and everything came unlocked, this miracle happened. The jailer figured, I'm dead, because if prisoners escape and you are the jailer, you are dead. And so he's freaking out, and Paul calls out to him in the dark, hey, don't, do yourself no harm. It's okay, everybody's still here. And so the jailer then says to, to um, Paul and to Silas, what do I do to be saved? Again, it's not, and Paul didn't say, you know, you need to be saved, because that's why this happened. But the guy asks him, hey, what do I do to be saved? His heart must have been touched by the singing that, wow, here are people who have real faith. And then the miracle happens, which gets his attention, and the greatest miracle of all, they didn't escape. And so now he is saying, I want to have what you have. I desire that. And some of the greatest evangelism happens because people see the life of somebody who has faith in Jesus, and they're like, wow, that's different. And how much easier it is to share with somebody who's actually drawn to you, to the example that you are, to the things that have happened in your life, and they, they actually want to know? Boy, it gives you so much more leverage. Paul, Paul said, you know, in verse 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved, and your family as well. And then he went, he, he, no doubt, he went to their house, it says, and and he probably told them a lot more, answered a lot of his questions. But again, what an amazing story of somebody getting saved without Paul dropping a tract on the floor as he was thrown into the cell. It was just, no, Paul was just being Paul. He was just having his relationship with God be open. And as a result, somebody's drawn to that by the Holy Spirit. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because... When we talk about the gospel, it's kind of, there are a lot of different angles we could take, but 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 8 is kind of Paul's description of, here's what the good news is. Here's what the gospel is. And he says, beginning with verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. This is what I preached. This is the gospel. You received it. You stand in it, by which also you were saved. So here's the gospel that I preach. Here's the gospel that I believe, that you believe this is how you got saved, if you hold fast to that word which was preached to you. Verse 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. There was a substitutionary atonement. Jesus died, but it was for our sins in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And he was buried. He was really dead. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. And that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. And he says, I'm the least of the apostles, and so on. So he says, here's the gospel. Jesus died for our sins, as the scripture predicted. He was really dead. He was actually buried. He rose again the third day. He came back from the dead in a resurrection. He was not resuscitated. He was not reincarnated. He didn't come back as a ghost. He rose again. The Jews understood resurrection was something that they expected to happen in the future. That's what Martha said to Jesus when he goes, Dad, don't worry, Lazarus is going to rise again. And she's like, yeah, I know, in the end times. That was their perception. They believed in ghosts. They believed in sometimes people being resuscitated. That's why you had to be dead for three days before they would even consider you to be dead. Resurrection meant I come back in my body, and in my body, it's different. It's been transformed, but it's still me. And they saw that, Paul saw that. The real resurrection, again, 
there are people who, just because of bad teaching or whatever, they think that we die and then we come back, we get a whole different body. But resurrection is, that's why they call it bodily resurrection. You're actually rising again in the same body that you had, but it has been transformed into a body that's suited for heaven. Now, that, what if you get cremated? How, you know, how does that work? Well, all God needs to have it be your body is for him to have the DNA. Your body keeps replicating itself all the time. So because your genetic code is in the mind of God, for him to resurrect that body is your same body, but it's greatly uh, modified um, as Jesus was when he came. And like sometimes they could recognize him, sometimes they couldn't. He'd come into the room, didn't need to use the door. He transported himself from Jerusalem to Galilee and back quickly. I mean, it had capacities that his body prior to that didn't have, but he actually literally rose from the dead. And Paul makes that as an important. And the rest of chapter 15 is Paul developing this whole theme of the bodily resurrection and how important that is. So, so he died for our sins. He rose from the dead. You know, well, he was buried. He rose from the dead, and a bunch of witnesses saw him. That's an important part of the gospel, too. When you talk to people about Jesus, it's important to emphasize how many people saw him and then gave their lives rather than to say, okay, maybe I didn't really see him. Or all of these people were, they weren't people who would then go, well, maybe it was a ghost. Now, nah, they always thought, they thought Jesus was a ghost when he was walking on the water. When Peter got let out of prison one time, knocked on the door, they heard his voice and, oh, it's Peter's ghost. They wouldn't give their lives to say Jesus died and came back as a ghost. It was because he rose from the dead. That's what's important. And if you're going to deal with Christianity, you have to deal with the fact that a bunch of people saw him in a physical body and it was literally him. And so that's basically the gospel is that he died for our sins, he rose, you know, he was buried, he rose again, and a bunch of people saw him after that. And when you talk about what to share with people, those are the important elements as Paul lays them out here. And so I think it's important for us to have that down. And I think that it's what sets Christianity off against just about every other religious system, that we have someone who was a real person, not some, not some spirit. He was literal flesh and blood, and he was killed, and he stayed dead for three days. He was buried, but he came back, and hundreds of people saw him, touched him, you know, held him. He was real. And of course, you know the rest of the story, he ended up ascending up into heaven. But that wasn't even the important thing. Paul, Paul was emphasizing, you know, he rose from the dead. If ever I want to talk to people about Jesus, one of the first things that I want to bring up, ultimately, through conversation, is the resurrection. And I'll respect people. They give me their ideas. They, I was talking to her this, this evening about a friend who's like really into you know, a lot of Eastern mysticism and all this stuff. And I go, I, I'll listen to that, but I'll say, I have something that really is so much deeper than that. An actual guy who died and rose from the dead and a bunch of people saw him and touched him. And it's, it's the one thing that really makes Christianity unique and powerful. And a few years ago, I read a book uh, by Anthony Flew, who was the, one of the most notorious atheists. All the popular atheists today all looked back at Anthony Flew, and he was the father of modern atheism. But towards the end of his life, he finally, just through philosophy, came to the conclusion that there has to be a God. And he wrote a, God, he wrote a book that the title of it was, There is Not a God, and then Not is Crossed Out. But Flu hadn't become a Christian, and I don't know if he ever became a Christian, but, but Flu said, at the end of his book, he said, all I'm saying is, there has to be a God. 
I don't know if he's a personal God. I don't know which God. There are a lot of theories about God. But then he said, in my appendix, um, Bishop Wright of the Anglican Church, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, he said, he makes the case for Christianity. And when I read that, I would have to say that Christianity is the version of God to beat. That's the one that's most cogent. This is a brilliant college professor who's not just jumping on with, okay, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But he listens, and, and in that appendix, N.T. Wright gives a beautiful description of Christianity using the resurrection as the main point. And if you've ever read any of, of Tom Wright's stuff, it's like the resurrection is the most important thing to him always. But just in the end of that book, he makes such a powerful case that one of the most brilliant men in the world says, that's the one to beat. You've got to come up with something better than that. The resurrection is vitally important to the gospel. Now, I put the Romans road here because it is a good, it's a method, and I'm not a big methods person, but it's something for you to remember in your mind, some scriptures. If you memorize these four scriptures, you'll have everything that you need to be able to, to uh, you know, to talk about the gospel to someone. And it lets you know kind of, these are some of the things that I want to be moving toward. So the scriptures are Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, and Romans 10.9 and 10. Now it's a little weird to go chapter 3, chapter 6, back to chapter 5, and then on to chapter 10, but there's a reason. Romans 3.23 says, and you should really know this verse, it's important, for all have sinned and come short or fall short of the glory of God. See, people get offended if you talk about them sinning until you say, we've all sinned. And here in this verse, you have a beautiful definition of sin. Sin is falling short of the glory of God, missing out on what God could have for you. The word sin, I talk about it all the time because I think so often Christians don't understand it, so I'm probably a broken record when it comes to sin. The Greek word means basically you missed your destiny. You are not living the life that you could be living. It's you've missed the mark, the mark, the glory of God, the mark, the best life that God could have for you. And, and so Romans 3.23 just goes, everybody's done that. Everybody has this problem. If you don't think that you have not had the life that, that you could have had or that you were designed to have, if you go, no, life's been perfect for me, we pretty much don't need to go any further in the discussion because you're not quite ready to understand that maybe you need someone else. But Romans 3.23, everybody has sinned and ripped themselves off and come short of the glory of God. Now, Romans 6.23, at least it's easy to remember because 3.23, 6.23. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the result of sin is death. That's where we pay the piper. So when we continue to live a life that is inferior to what it could be, ultimately that ends by death. And so, sorry, that's the way it goes. If we can't find a way to elevate our life, then our life will continue to deteriorate until finally death is there. And again, I think that most people who you talk to, if you share with them, my burden is I want to have the best life I can have. The truth is I've missed the mark on that a lot. But the thing that really scares me is if I just keep going the way I'm going, it's going to end in death. So pretty easy to grip onto. But then in Romans 5.8, you have this great news. And again, you could use John 3.16 in place of it. I like the Roman road just because they're all in Romans, so you can just flip a few pages and share it this way. But, but God demonstrates his own love toward us. Or in the King James, it says, but God commendeth. It just means demonstrates 
his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So now the idea comes, as Paul shares it in Romans, that actually God loves us. And despite our sin, despite the fact that we fail, that we're heading to death, while we're sinners, Jesus died for us. He did something in his death that made it possible for us to have life. Now, the thing about, um, you know, there are other methods for, for witnessing, and one of them Bill Bright wrote called The Four Spiritual Laws. And I think they're good. Plenty of people have got saved through the four spiritual laws. But the four spiritual laws start out, law number one is God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. The thing I like about this is we begin to establish not only his love, but our predicament. And not that, oh, we're guilty. and we're, No, it's, it's not about guilt at this point at all. It's about you're your own punishment. You're messing up your own life. God doesn't want that to happen. He loves us. Jesus died for us, even while we were sinners, proving that he didn't see in us something that made him think he could use us. Who would die for somebody who sins against them? Who would die for people who don't even believe in them? But Christ died for us in Romans 5, 8. And then you have Paul's you know, description, really, of this, of this decision in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, where he says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That kind of wraps it all up. That at some point, when you understand that Jesus died for you and you needed that. You understand that he loves you. Now, are you willing to agree with him, to confess? The, to confess, the word just means to say the same thing. So it's not just about, okay, yeah, I think I believe that. But will you go out on a limb and actually say, yes, I believe that Jesus died for my sins I believe that he rose from the dead. You know, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Now, does this mean that you can't accept the Lord without saying it or without praying the sinner's prayer with someone or something like that? No, certainly not. Um, to confess is, if you are even saying that within your own heart to him, that would still be fine. Some people don't even have the opportunity. Or what about somebody who isn't able to speak, for instance? But the idea is, I want what he's giving me. I want to receive his gift. Because God won't force salvation on anyone. He wants you to say, I like this idea myself. I want this. It's not because he wants you to crawl. But it's because he wants there to be that place where you actually choose that you want to walk with him, that you want to be forgiven. It's the whole idea of confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart isn't for him. It's, it's for you. It's for us to be able to actually say this. Yep, that's what I want. It kind of solidifies it in our hearts. So Romans 10, 9, and 10 is really important as, as you know, Jesus is Lord and he raised from the dead it, then you become saved. And that's really an important verse. So Romans 3, 23, Romans 6, 23, Romans 5, 8, Romans 10, 9, and 10 kind of lays out the response to the gospel that the gospel that Paul lays out in the first eight chapters of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, our time is up, but a few concluding thoughts there. And I say the first one I put here is the importance of infiltration. We have responsibility to share our faith with people. It's actually probably the only reason why God has left us here. It's certainly the reason why he has not returned yet. Because as we read from Second Peter, hey, he's patient because he doesn't want anybody to perish but for all to come to repentance. Our primary goal in life is not to become the best people that we can be. We'll do that much better in heaven. 
Our primary purpose for life is not just to learn more stuff. We can do that better in heaven. Our primary purpose in life is not to fellowship and enjoy each other's company. We will do that better in heaven. Everything that we can do in life, we can do better in heaven except for the opportunity we have to get to know people who don't know Jesus and to be able to share the words of life with them, to make a difference in their life so that they can come to heaven with us. And again, there are some people whose idea of, I, say, I use the term infiltration, that's one that we don't think about a lot. For a lot more people, for Christianity, they think Christians need to be, have separation so important that we're, you know, away. And then there are increasingly many people who believe in isolation, that basically we need to not have anything to do with non-Christians. We need to build our lives around the fact that the only people we ever see or talk to are Christians. Now, I will admit that life would be a lot more pleasant if you never had to talk to somebody who doesn't know Jesus. We could but what happens, and a lot of times we do this, and I get concerned when I hear that people at their work have a noontime Bible study where all the Christians get together, and then when they do fun things on the weekend, it's always with Christians, and, and we, you know all their friends are Christians, and their kids go to a Christian school, and they play in Christian sports teams, and they do Christian Boy Scouts, and the problem with that is all that stuff we will have all of eternity. It's great. I love it. I would not exclude fellowship from my life at all, but I am not here to be isolated. I am not here to be separated. I am here to infiltrate my mission and yours. As, and my calling as a pastor is primarily to speak to Christians, but it's so that I can equip you so that you can go out there and associate with and connect with people who need to be saved from an eternity in hell and there are, as we've talked about, a lot of ways to do that. Everyone has different roles and different gifts and things like that. But we are here to make a difference. We are not here to protect ourselves. We are not here to be afraid of the influence of the world dragging us down and destroying us. We are here as spies, representing the God of heaven, that we will become a part of society and open up doors and opportunities to contact people who don't know him. If we don't have any friends who are non-Christians, if we don't have any activities that involve non-Christians, if all we do is surround ourselves with believers, what's the point in us even being here? We are called to make a difference by penetrating society, by meeting people. If Jesus had stayed out of Samaria, that whole village wouldn't have got saved. As far as that goes, if Jesus had just stayed in heaven where he belonged, then you know, there wouldn't, he would have never been crucified. But we are called to infiltrate in whatever way that God wants us to. And again, not to force it on people, not to shove it down their throats, not to go argue with people, not to persuade them of how stupid they are, not to, not to get votes for our side. Or not. No, it's... It's just to be able to uh, have an opportunity to influence people with the truth and how can we best influence them. So infiltration is important. Conversation is incredibly important too. There are some people I know who conversation is just a gift that they have. My friend Al say it here. He could have a conversation with anyone. You put him in a room of strangers and he's gonna end up knowing them. Kenny Kreekak is that way too. He's just a natural conversationalist. There are some of us for whom that's more challenging, but you will never infiltrate unless you can conversate. And so as you see what Jesus did, I mean, talk about somebody who was pretty much an introvert. That was Jesus. He wasn't like the life of the party, but Jesus engaged in conversations with people. And a lot of times they were the ones who started the conversation and he worked the conversation. And again, they were all different. You know, we talk about saying, hey, you need to be born again. Well, you know, Jesus never said that to anyone else as far as we know, only said it to one guy. Uh, conversation is boring 
if you just keep saying the same things or talking about trivial things. But do we understand that part of our responsibility as those who want to share God's love with people needs to be how can we create interesting conversations that the Holy Spirit can use to actually at least to share a little something, to plant some seeds, not to hustle them to close the deal, but if we are not having good conversations, ultimately high-level conversations about things that matter. And the, the opportunities are there all the time. People say things that are just begging for us. You know, if they go, oh, man, I don't know what's going to happen to this world. You don't have to go, well, actually, I know because the Bible says. But you can go, I know what you mean. The place is a mess. It's one of the reasons why, you know, I started thinking, I need God in my life. And let that go. And you go, eh, I don't have much use for God. And, and you go, okay, maybe that's all I'm supposed to say, or maybe I'm supposed to say, well, he likes you, even if you don't believe in him, so it's cool. You know, and I like you too, and you're worth something to me. The gift of making conversation, even when that doesn't come naturally to us, you will never ultimately share Christ with people in a way that matters if you don't even like talking to people. If you can be around... If you can be in an elevator with a bunch of people and, and you can't even say, hey, hi, boy, it's a nice day. This is what humans do. This is what we are called to do. And it's what ultimately opens doors to share the good news is that at first we respect people enough, we care about them enough that we'll actually talk to them about stuff. And then finally, the importance of invitation. I think we need to be sensitive to understanding that at some point there are people who are just dying to be invited. There are people, whenever there's holidays, like Mother's Day is coming up this Sunday, we just went through Easter, and before you know it, it'll be Christmas, and all kinds of polls have established that most people out there, if somebody who's their friend, who knows them, would invite them to church, they would come. There are an awful lot of people who would actually like for you to just be able to talk to them a little about Jesus. And it doesn't have to be, you, boy, I've noticed what a mess you are. You really need Jesus. But to tell them your story and then listen to their story. Again, it's that conversation. Will you listen to them? If so, they will listen to you. But ultimately, at some point, you either need to invite people into a relationship with them. It may be just inviting them to your small group or inviting them to come to church or inviting them to, hey, let's go see this movie or, hey, let's get together for dinner. And you, know, and you pray before that dinner of, Lord, please open doors in this conversation. But people need to be invited or they are usually not gonna beat your door down to make demands of you. But people will be honored when someone who loves them, respects them, has given them time, got to know them, knows what's going on in their life. I mean, I have a lot of people that, because they know I'm a pastor, at, like at my gym, there are a bunch of guys there that know that I care about them. And I'll always go, hey, man, I'm praying for you because of your bad back. And they're like, well, that's so great. you know. And, and, and then they get to where they'll come and ask me for prayer, you know, and sometimes I'll just say, hey, let me pray with you right now. I've never had anyone be offended by that, because I'm not just going, you know, all I care about is that you become a Christian. No, I care about them. That's why I want them to become a Christian, but I'll trust the Holy Spirit to work in their lives, but it's important for us to have a spirit of invitation. Hey, come and be a part of my life. Come and let me help you with something. Oh, you're you know, you're moving, let me help you load the truck. Or, you know, there, there are invitations that we can put out there that draw people into our lives. And those are the kinds of things that I think it's important. Now, we've only touched the surface of this subject, but, you know, I think it's the basics. I hope you get the idea. You can go back and read through some of these passages of Scripture, and it may give you a lot more ideas. But I pray for all of us that we will understand the only thing ultimately between now and when we die or are raptured, the only thing that we do that matters forever is how we share 
our faith in Jesus, how we share God's love for other people. To our kids, to our grandkids, to our neighbors, to the people that we work with, to the people that we know from school, to, you know, that's our job. That's not just my job. That's your job too. Whatever else it is that God's called you to do, he wants you to be a light for him. It starts again with just getting to know people, having good conversations with them, showing them respect, asking for their help. All of these things set the stage. And you're not doing all of those things so that you'll get them to become a Christian. You're doing those things because you care about them. If they happen to become a Christian, so much the better. But Jesus was just as kind with people who rejected him as people who accepted him. He wanted people to know that they mattered to him, and he wants people to know that from us as well. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for noticing us. Most of us were, were so lost without you. Maybe some of us actually felt literally lost. I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going on in my life. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know who I am. And you just worked your way into our lives. Showed us respect. That you even respect our ability to reject you. and That doesn't seem to make you mad. But Lord, help us to be voices of your love, of your respect, of your hope, of your promises to those around us. Challenge each of us to make sure that there are at least some activities that we do in our lives specifically so that we can maintain contact and show care and concern to people who don't know you yet, that you might use us by your spirit to draw them into an awareness that their life can be changed forever. Help us to remember how important this is, but help us not to force it. Help us to be led by your spirit in a natural, comfortable way. And we will give you all the glory for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, God bless you. I guess I should just say this goes from 7 to 8, 15, then I won't feel so guilty. <laughs> but we'll see you. See you Sunday.